Hello, my name is Walt Lingerfeld and I'm a fellow in training with Evidence in Motion. Today's presentation will discuss concepts and treatments related to the conservative management of TOS. These are the objectives for the presentation. You can pause and peruse these at your own leisure. There will be a second part of this presentation which will go into more detail of the treatment associated with TOS. Okay, so let's quickly review some of the relevant anatomy in TOS presentations. From proximal to distal, the three most common entrapment sites usually discussed include the interscalene triangle, where the anterior and middle scalenes form the anterior and posterior borders of this triangle, and the rib forms the inferior border. The next region is the costoclavicular space, where structures can be compressed between the clavicle and first rib theoretically as the first rib becomes elevated. The subclavius muscle and costocorcoid ligaments may also be related to entrapment here, but is much less common. The other most common entrapment site is underneath the pec minor tendon and muscle, referred to sometimes as the subcorcoid tunnel. There are a few lesser known entrapment sites reported in the literature. The neurovascular structures can also be compressed in regions anterior to the humeral head, in the median nerve compass, which is sort of a Y-shaped passage formed between the median nerve roots and containing the axillary artery, as well as in the regions of the axilla. When we talk about the actual structures being compressed in each of the aforementioned sites, the brachial plexus can be entrapped really in any of those regions, most commonly the lower plexus affecting the C8 and T1 nerve roots. Notice that the subclavian artery can be compressed between the scalenes, but the vein runs just anterior to the anterior scalene and therefore isn't subject to compression. The axillary artery and veins which aren't mentioned in many cases, can be entrapped primarily in the retropectorial space. The majority of patients affected by TOS are women, predominantly in the 20 to 50 age group, and are generally three to four times more likely to experience symptoms. Although it's very rare for children to experience symptoms, older teenagers can have symptoms that are very vague and of low severity initially that may worsen over time. There are reports of the overall incidence of TOS, but Hwang re reports roughly three to 80 cases per thousand individuals. And some report the incidence as being extremely rare in site one in one million. However, from my clinical experience, that number seems pretty low. The incidence of unilateral versus bilateral symptoms is not well established, but in a study by Landry of 153 patients undergoing surgery for TOS symptoms, 40% in the operative group noted bilateral symptoms, and 23% in the conservative group had bilateral symptoms. So unilateral symptoms may be a more common occurrence, and experientially seems to coincide with what I've seen in the past, but bilateral symptoms occur frequently as well. There are a number of possible contributors to TOS symptomology, most of which are unrelated to anatomic anomalies. We will go into more detail on mechanical factors later, but for the time being, essentially anything that reduces the space in the aforementioned sites potentially can lead to various symptoms associated with brachial plexus irritation or vascular compression or irritation. Postural factors, and particularly the patient that has drooping shoulders, can create excessive tension on the plexus or can narrow the costoclavicular gap. Elevation of the first rib may be facilitated by scalene tone, which can create symptoms, or scalene tone, perhaps by a motor vehicle accident or some other mechanism, may in and of itself cause entrapment more proximal. Pec minor shortening or repetitive overhead activities, particularly with abnormal postures, can also be influential in generating symptoms. This is really where a detailed subjective history can help you understand the activities
potentially facilitating these abnormal postures or mechanical impairments. Numerous congenital factors can also be um, factors in symptom generation. Cervical ribs can be a common occurrence in TOS and are found in roughly 1% of the general population. However, only about 10% of those individuals are symptomatic. In a 2001 study, Sanders found that 80% of individuals with cervical ribs and TOS symptoms had those symptoms only after some type of initial injury. In looking at a cadaver study by Javonin, normal anatomy in relation to all the thoracic outlets, so to speak, occurred in only about 10% of the population, and this was in an almost 100 dissections. So potentially many of us have underlying factors that could cause symptoms, but usually don't. We will see in later slides a common theme of high false positive rates in many of the tests designed to diagnose TOS. And thinking about the Juvonin study, this makes some sense. Again, as in with any body region, the presence of structural pathology isn't always indicative of pain or loss of function. There are many other mediating factors that are determinants for impairments. Although this list is an all-inclusive these are a few of the structural congenital factors that may be observed at the entrapment sites. And one note here is that scaling hypertrophy isn't really a congenital factor, but can occur through years of structural adaptation. A much less frequent cause could be attributed to trauma in the AC or clavicular regions, or some type of space occupying lesion that compresses the brachial plexus or vascular structures. As we have alluded to in previous slides, thoracic, thoracic outlet syndrome is broadly categorized as either having a vascular or neurologic cause with subdivisions of each. Arterial complications from TOS are a rather rare occurrence and occur in roughly 1% of the cases. Sanders reported that over 2,500 operations related to TOS, only 11 were due to arterial problems. Venous abnormalities are also a rather rare occurrence. However, in general, they seem to happen slightly more frequently than arterial events, although the reporting on this can be a little mixed. Vascular symptoms may be the result of direct compression or repeated friction of one structure against another, which triggers some type of intravascular thrombolic event. And typically, bony congenital abnormalities are the causes in both venous and arterial events. But by far, we see more incidents of compression or traction issues associated with the brachial plexus, and in most cases, without having any radiographic or electrophysiologic evidence of anything occurring. Those individuals are deemed symptomatic or disputed. And in contrast, those who actually have some concrete findings with nerve conduction velocity or congenital factors, they're deemed a neurologic or true neurologic or non-disputed group. It's also important to remember that vascular findings and neurologic findings can occur together. This is a nice chart out of the Hooper 2010 paper that lists features amongst different types of TOS. You can pause and take a look at this chart or refer to the original paper, but just wanted to point out a few features. Having a diminished pulse or coolness of the skin, particularly in the distal extremity, may point to a more vascular cause where a puffy edematous extremity that is cyanotic should get you thinking to a more vascular cause. As we mentioned before, hand coldness is one of those symptoms you can see occurring in both arterial and neurologic cases. Whereas the arterial symptoms are due to ischemia, the neurologic symptoms may be due to a Raynaud's phenomenon. Essentially, an overactive sympathetic nervous system whose fibers run circumferentially around the C8 and T1 nerve roots, um, and when aggravated, can produce the hand coldness or color changes we traditionally see with this disorder. Under the true and symptomatic neurologic columns, you can also see the term compressors and releasers. 
I will refer back to this later in the presentation, but distinguishing between the two may help us determine the best treatment approaches. In general, compressors tend to have more symptoms throughout the day with activities that compress the neurovascular structures, and releasers tend to have more symptoms at night as the pair seizures are often brought on as compression is taken off of the neurovascular structures, which often disturbs sleep. This is a similar chart as the previous one, but has a little more detail. Again, you can see there's a myriad of signs and symptoms associated with TOS. Traditionally, we think of neurologic symptoms, again, only being in the C8 and T1 distribution, which may be due to only the lower portion of the plexus being in contact with the undersurface of the rib as it exits the intercellular triangle. However, the upper plexus can certainly be involved here as well. Also note where we see the manifestation of symptoms, the head, the scapula, the upper extremities, the cervical regions, etc., etc. Just remember that multiple regions can be involved at the same time and can sometimes refer pain into some obscure areas. This is a list of some of the differentials to consider. It should always be a first thought when a patient walks into the door to determine if they actually belong in the clinic and if it's an immediate problem or can wait for another time. In the case of a vascular compression or potential venous issue where there's an edematous or cyanotic limb, that's a phone call that should happen that day to screen for a potential thrombosis. Other situations that should warrant more immediate investigation revolves around systemic complaints, particularly suspected cardiac referral. Cervical radiculopathy is another but less serious diagnosis masquerading as TOS in many cases. However, we would expect that cervical radiculopathy occur in a more dermatomal fashion. We also understand that there can be overlapping dermatomes in the patients, as well as muscular referrals masquerading in similar patterns as nerve roots and peripheral nerves, and it really makes this job of differentially diagnosing tough at times. The Wainer CPR in 2003, which most of us probably are somewhat familiar with, may help weed out some of these differences. However, remember that this CPR isn't designed to be sensitive. The other important concept to understand is that TOS may be occurring at the same time as other pathologies. And some of the same impairments that exacerbate TOS may also exacerbate the rotator cuff, for example. There are a whole host of other issues presenting similar to TOS and the above chart does a great job of really helping us with some of the key findings. This is a slide just listing out uh, the symptoms and showing the variability in location. And looking at these potential symptoms, what other diagnosis can come across your differential list? I think the answer here is quite a few. This slide gives us a breakdown of how often some of the symptoms mentioned actually occur. This was based on the observations of the last 50 patients presenting with a likely TOS diagnosis in a surgeon's office. Obviously, this is not high level evidence and we can't base our entire observations on these particular findings for multiple reasons, but the trends seem to be similar to what is reported in, in other literature. We see high percentages of paresthesias, trapezius and supraclavicular pains, as well as arm pains. What I thought to be interesting here is that it was more common for paresthesias to affect all the digits and not just only the ulnar digits. Certainly challenges some of our traditional thought patterns here. And I think the important thing to remember is the next time a patient presents with a strange cluster of head and arm symptoms with or without paresthesias, add TOS to the potential list of diagnoses. Way back in 1986, Rib and colleagues investigated 315 individuals with cervicobrachial symptoms and attempted to find the most reliable means to detect TOS. The factors that are seen on this slide was termed the TOS index. 
and three of four findings were thought to be indicative of TOS, and from their investigations, occurred in 94% of that population. Unfortunately, there was a fairly high false positive rate. In terms of the objective examination, there are a number of things that we can look at here. One of those is related to postural abnormalities. Oftentimes you will see a classic presentation of a depressed shoulder girdle or drooping shoulder syndrome, which we will see later in this presentation. A little clinical pearl here is if the AC joint is not sitting about 15 to 20 degrees higher than the SC joint, then there is likely too much depression occurring. This again may lead to either traction on the neurovascular structures or potentially compression depending on the interval that you're considering. In addition to a depressed shoulder girdle, someone may also present with excessive retraction in the scapula, which may facilitate downward rotation, or protrusion, which may facilitate an anteriorly tipped scapula, both of which may lead to potential compression at multiple sites. A forward head position may also lead to the same excessively protracted position that we just mentioned. An adverse neurodynamics is a frequent observation in this population and if appropriate on day one should be screened. We have seen that the upper limb tension test A to have very high sensitivity in the cervical nerve roots, brachial plexus and upper limb pain in general. There's also a modified version of LV that is reported um, in the literature related to TOS, but it's not necessarily specific to one nerve. From an observation perspective, you can look for color changes, fullness in the supraclavicular region, some of the posture issues we discussed, or observe for an edematous extremity. The picture to the left on the right hand is a Giliant Sumner hand, and this is generally evidence of those with true neurologic causes and involves severe wasting of the abductor pollicis brevis, and to a lesser extent, the hypothenar musculature. This can happen as the APB is innervated by the recurrent branch from the median nerve, but through the C8 and T1 nerve roots. Checking for muscle um, strength impairments, particularly in the scapular region, is an important consideration, particularly when postural factors may be a contributor to symptoms. The Syriax release test will be discussed a bit later, but essentially helps us distinguish between the releaser versus the compressor phenomenon mentioned earlier. There are also a number of special tests which we will discuss in a bit more detail. There are a plethora of tests described in the literature for attempting to diagnose TOS. And one of the purposes for these tests initially was to help decipher between entrapment sites. Unfortunately, given the high false positive rates and the reliability issues associated with these tests, their utility is questioned. Perhaps the most important argument against using these tests is that very few of them are actually testing for neurologic TOS, which encompasses the vast majority of the cases. Some have argued that testing for familiar reproduction of symptoms versus assessing for pulse change improves the clinical utility. This seems to have good face validity, but isn't necessarily how the clinometrics are reported in the literature. The Adson's maneuver, which you see to the left, is one of the most classically described tests where the patient is rotating and extending their cervical spine toward the site of symptoms while the examiner assesses for pulse change or reproduction of symptoms. Although this picture doesn't show it, you will often see the arm extended and laterally rotated slightly all while holding a breath. One of the problems that you will see is the inconsistency in which the tests are performed. Alone, the specificity is just shy of 0.8 with a modest negative likelihood ratio. And in a study by Dragutis and Barnes, arterial occlusion occurred in more than half of the asymptomatics tested in their study population.
Plua and Dellinger noted about an 11% false positive rate for both, both pulse changes and neurologic reproduction. The costocalvicular maneuver, or the military brace test as it's sometimes called, assesses for entrapment mostly at the first rib. The first two portions of the test labeled A and B should be provocative maneuvers and the assessment can be either for a pulse change or neurologic symptoms up to about 30 seconds. If the test is then performed in the relieving position, C, if the test symptoms if the symptoms were reproduced in the B position and in the position D, if positive, if positive in the position A, you will see another version of this test that extends the arm to about 30 degrees unilaterally and maintains the depressed and retracted position, which is simply biased more of a pulse assessment. In the picture you, you see here, there's a bilateral assessment occurring same type of reporting that you saw with the Atsons maneuver and that there's better sensitivity than specificity um, with some false pauses, most predominantly with vascular findings. Rights or the hyperabduction maneuver assesses for entrapment potentially at the retropectoral space and even uh, the costoclavicular space. There are a few different ways this test is reported in the literature, but most will discuss two parts of the test. The first part involves abducting the shoulder to just shy of 90 and externally rotating the shoulder to 90 degrees and assessing for reproduction of symptoms either through pulse change or onset of neurologic symptoms. The test position is held for about a minute and there is thought that if you perform again in the hyperabducted position, you will bias the costoclavicular region, which is shown to the picture in the picture to the left. And notice that in the picture that the wrist remains fairly neutral here. The thought is by keeping the wrist in neutral and the elbow flexed to less than 90, less than 45 degrees, you will reduce possible contributions from the carpal or cubital tunnel. And as you can see here, there are a range of clinometrics reported. Probably the most well-known test is the ruse test, which has several other names. This appears to be an all-encompassing test as it's believed to stress the neurovascular structures in all of the entrapment sites. The test position is shown to the left and the patient opens and closes the hands until symptoms are reproduced um, on or for about three minutes, which ever comes first. There's a ton of variability in the reported metrics here. Plua and Dellinger suggest that shortening the test to 90 seconds improves the specificity considerably. At best, there's a modest positive likelihood ratio. In a study by Costigan and Wilburn out of the Neuro Neurology Journal, there were 60 65 subjects with confirmed carpal tunnel syndrome through nerve conduction uh, studies as well as 24 asymptomatic individuals. What they found was that 92% of those with carpal tunnel syndrome and 74% of the asymptomatic group tested positive with ruse testing. Therefore, in those with carpal tunnel syndrome, it may be very difficult to separate using this test and is not specific in this population. You can also see the high percentage of individuals in the, asympt in the asymptomatic population. The cervical rotation lateral flexion test is probably the most common test used in clinical practice. The thought is that elevation of the first rib restricts the coupling motion at the CT region as the first rib abuts against the transverse process. The side being tested is opposite to the side of rotation and as you can see above, the right side is abnormal and represents possible restriction in the first rib. Notice how the examiner uses his elbows to stabilize the shoulders, and I actually like this approach, as in many cases it's difficult to maintain the rotation of the head and lateral flexion component, so using two hands really helps to eliminate this problem.
There are a number of tests that I did not mention here, but the same mindset applies in that there are no silver bullets when it comes to recognizing a TOS presentation. Although combining tests helps with clinometrics, we really need to look at the whole picture, which starts with a solid subjective exam. We know that performing several of these tests together may in fact improve specificity, and in a study by Gillard, a cluster of two tests yielded a sensitivity of 0.9, while five positive tests increased the specificity to 0.84. However, I think there are a few points to consider here. One, there are a wide range of reported values in many of the special tests that we observe. Two, what constitutes a positive finding? Now, oftentimes, they may differ from study to study. We saw in some of the tests that were previously described that modifications existed. Did the authors use a diminished radial pulse or reproduction of symptoms as a positive finding? We have to ask ourselves, did the authors account for these changes when we look at a particular paper? Three, sample sizes vary greatly, as well as male to female ratio. Given there is a higher prevalence in females, then the sample type may have an impact on the findings. Four, how was TOS defined, particularly given that most cases are disputed or symptomatic? And five, were other causes accurately ruled out? This is really where the ability to appraise the literature is a valuable tool. All of the factors make me hesitant to use only the findings of a special test to quote diagnose TOS. Cerv cervical rotation lateral flexion test in my clinical practice is the one I use the most because if it's clearly restricted, then I can use that as a reassessment tool to gauge the effectiveness of my intervention. In the second part of this TOS presentation, we will discuss more of the treatments related and we will add a case study to help integrate all the information that we've talked about thus far.